Thank you for singing that beautiful hymn. It has a, I have a soft spot in my heart for it, and I was delighted when I saw you up there. Um, today's uh, sermon is going to pay no attention to the reading. So those of you who, who are used to my wandering around and eventually bringing it back, this time I'll never come back, so don't even think about it. <laughs> um, I'm talking to the spiritual family, all of you who are in the room and through our recording and so on, the people that we talk to around the world, because our um, life together here has uh, reached a critical juncture in one of the responsibilities that we're caring not a crisis, not a catastrophe, nothing like that, just the opposite. It's a great opportunity and we're standing on the cusp of enormous possibilities. And I realized, I realized in conjunction with Kabir and others who are involved in our, the founding of our high school, that we really uh, need to apply more willpower and more devotion and more prayer demands to this. Um, Many years ago at Ananda Village, when we first started there, literally 1969, Swami Kriyananda purchased 72 acres of land, which is still the seclusion retreat. It was very secluded and very quiet. And he thought he could start a community and a meditation retreat in the same place. And then gradually, when it got more established, could move the community to another place. 72 acres looked like a lot of land. So we were going to have this quiet meditation retreat and we were going to have families. However, one of the first families that came was uh, included a little girl named Cece. And no meditation retreat and Cece could exist, perhaps on a thousand acres of land. And Jyotish, she used to come over and visit Jyotish and one day he said he heard her sort of, she was about maybe four at the time. And he had, uh, things were a little, um, rough the way they were done and so the first step up to his house was a pretty big one and he heard her scrambling around out there trying to get up the step and finally she stepped back and she said this is going to require my full blast she said like that and then she sort of ran at it and threw herself on the porch and got all the way in well I'm sort of feeling like we've been working for several years and many great souls have devoted a great deal of energy to establishing the, the last phase of our responsibility for education for life here in Palo Alto, and that's in the high school. And I think it's going to require our full blast. And you know, most people in the world work in the ways of the world. You get five-year plans, you kickstart, you do this and that, you do all the different things that are available to creative, intelligent people to make things happen. But one of the things people also do is they use their contacts, they call in their favors, and they ask their friends in high places to help them. <laughs> and we are in a position to call in a lot of favors, and we have a lot of friends in a lot of high places. And that's what we need to work with today. And later, at the end of our service, we're going to try to focus all that energy. But in the meantime, I wanted to talk to you not so much as a pep rally, but as a real conversation about really what Ananda is and why we're doing and why we do what we do and how it relates to our spiritual life. When I came to Ananda, I had met Swami Kriyananda. Many of you have heard me say this. I met him in 1969 because of past life association. There's just no other explanation. He walked into the door and I knew he was my destiny. I knew he was my spiritual teacher. I knew my life would be defined by this person. I made a decision in about 10 seconds before I heard him speak. And it, you know, it, it seems crazy if you think that we're all meeting for the first time. It's not crazy at all if you realize that we've just been separated by death for a period of time and the process of getting to be old enough to be able to make your own choices. And then you just pick up exactly where you left off because that's really how the flow of incarnation works. So it was, oh, there you are. Oh, this is what I've been waiting for. Now my life can really begin. But I was very intellectual in my spirituality and very much of a purist, so much so that the first time I tried to read Autobiography of a Yogi, I didn't like it. All that devotion, all those miracles, it was like, what did this have to do with the austere yogi path that I was on like this? When I met Kriyananda, somehow 
I didn't know what happened exactly, but he was the, the necessary intermediary. And I found the book fascinating, and I couldn't understand why I didn't understand it before, because my connection with him just vibrationally, automatically put me in tune with Yogananda. But still, when I came to Ananda, I was in, entirely focused on Kriyananda. And because of my one-pointed dedication, he responded, because it, he, as he has trained all of us, you need to work with the people who are interested in what you're doing. And I was intensely interested, and within a month he asked me if I would work with him as his secretary, and invited me to the small gatherings he had every week, and the, well, the rest is history. Here I am. It's, it's, it never stopped from that whole time. But at the beginning, I, I loved that we had a community, that we had a retreat, all of that was marvelous. I went into the kitchen, I started making all the food for people. But I still held this certain disdain for all of that. You know, I was here for God, you know. And it was all going on around me, and I was really happy to take the benefit of it. And, and live from the fruits of other people's efforts but I always just felt myself to be a little above the necessity to take it seriously. And at that time, Swami Kriyananda drove his own car, and I was sitting in the back of the, of the car one day, and we were driving through the community. His house was at the far edge from the entrance, which was more than a mile through these winding dirt roads at that time. So we were making that ride, and I was just sitting in the back seat of the car. I always f felt and felt... I always felt like a child in his presence to the end of his life. You know, when I was far from childlike, my child age myself, but I always felt like a child in his presence. So sitting in the back seat of the car, you know, looking out the window, I felt I was about six, which was probably my spiritual age, maybe subtract a little. But anyway, looking out, looking out the window like that, and I was just observing how much of a community, even then, had already been carved out of the wilderness. You know, there was just nothing there. I remember the first time one of our guests from L.A. came, and we had actually paved the roads. And she, she was with friends who didn't understand. I mean, most of the places in the world, roads are paved. So she pulls onto Ananda, and she sees this paved road. She stops the car. She gets out. She lies full flat on the paved road like this and says to her friends, paved road like this. And her friends go like, Huh? Like, what are you talking about? Paved road? And she said, you have no idea what it's taken for these people to be able to pave the roads. Because once, once it's already done, it's just there. And you weren't there dragging it up from the mud. I'll give you one more. When we were doing the Finding Happiness movie, which many of you have seen, we had this whole Hollywood crew. It was a real professional crew. And our, our protagonist, our reporter, who's reporting on Ananda. We're now at the expanding light. She's going to be there for her first week. And so we have given, for the, for the movie, we have given her our absolute primo room. And, you know, among the things that makes it so primo is it has its own bathroom. <laughs> Can you imagine? Its own indoor bathroom. And, and our crew, our director comes and he looks at this and he, you know, he drags the artistic director in, and everybody, they're all looking at it like this, and saying, do you have anything better? <laughs> better? What's better than this? You know, and he says, he sort of, you know, he, he, he was very gracious, and so I tried to walk in, and it looked at it from their point of view. Of course, everything was absolutely as cheap as it could possibly be, and, you know, the bathroom was, it was like almost industrial in its simplicity. For the first time ever, I saw what it actually looked like to them. It looked like Motel 6 or maybe Motel 4, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, and I, and I just, I got it. And I said to Ted, who was our director, I said, Ted, we dragged this up inch by inch from the wilderness. And when we finally got to here, it was a mountain that was so heroic to scale, it looked so different to us. And so we got it. And so if you, when you watch Finding Happiness, 
they bring the actors in there and so on. She looks, she looks around kind of like this. Well, it won't hurt me to live like a monk for a week. She says like that. <laughs> Which was a line Ted insisted on adding into the movie. Because that's how it looked to him. So, in other words, let me just try to find where I'm trying to, to take this. Is... And so in here, I'm back in the car, so I'm looking out the window, and I'm realizing how much effort it has taken. And here I am. I'm absolutely devoted to Swami Kriyananda. He is my best friend on a level that I never knew it was possible to have a friend who would be so unconditional and so wise. And I was devoted to him in the sense of I did a secretarial work, I often cooked for him, you know, all of that. And then I realized that Swami Kriyananda was devoted to the project. And he was literally pouring out his life's blood, you know, dragging that community out of the wilderness inch by inch by inch. And in 1970, 71, 72, it did not look at all like what it looks like now. And that was even beyond imagination of expectancy for us. And he was day after day, hour after hour, despite health, despite money problems, despite antagonism, he was pouring himself into it. And I'm just riding in the back seat, you know, just taking what I can. Because I'm too spiritual to participate. And all of a sudden it's like, eh, I think there's something like super wrong with this picture. Like, what do I know what spiritual is? I'm here to find out from him. That's why I came. If I didn't need to learn from him, why would I have come? And how did he know? He learned from his master, Paramhansa Yogananda. And what did Paramhansa Yogananda do? He left India, he came to America, he sacrificed everything. He gave his life's blood to establish an entire new reality in a country that really didn't care and was completely alien to what he was trying to do. You know, some of the darker stories of his efforts have only recently been come out, thank you, by the uh, movie Awake. You know, his time in Miami when he tried to speak to integrated audiences and was literally driven out of town. Who wants to hear a color man talk about God? You know, he, that was one of many. He had people betray him and there was a certain point where all of his work for 15 years, somebody betrayed him, took all his money and many of his students and just left. It was no like easy thing for him to do. At a certain point, Yogananda left America and went to Mexico. He just had it. You know, it's like, I'm, I may never come back, he said. He was just so tired of that effort. But of course, Divine Mother said, for this where you were born. And why did he do that? Well, for you, for me, for all the countless thousands who have been through this building and all the other buildings and this building, you know, it's a revolution. And it is the most desperately needed revolution that you can imagine. It's not guns, it's not political power, it's not money, it's not technology, although Steve Jobs was devoted to Yogananda and that one individual has had more effect on transforming the world and moving it to Dwapara Yuga than anything else. The masters care about this planet because we have to live here and what we have to live with and the conditions under which we live are our karma and our opportunity to grow. And it's not our job to take. Greater can no love be than this, as we say in the Festival of Light. From a life of infinite joy and freedom in God, willingly to embrace limitation, pain, and death for the salvation of others. And in our festival of light, there are four stages of growth. We abandon the mission. We rebel against the truth of life. We, we begin to suffer so much that it occurs to us that maybe there is another way. So we begin to quest. That, we, that, that we, we begin to quest for where are we? What are we going to do? And now I can't even remember what the third stage is. Somebody tell me. What is the third? The mission was the first? Anyway, wherever we are, the mission is the first. 
We're sent out on the mission. We rebel against it. We request, we quest for truth. And the fourth stage is redemption. And the redemption comes because the master's greater can no love be than this. From a life of infinite joy, we come back to help. Now, all of us may not feel that we've come back. We feel like we were trapped here. It's not the freedom of the masters. But how do we get the freedom of the masters? And those paragraphs in the festival are very interesting to read. Here, then, is the fourth and last stage, which is when we give back. Jesus says in the Bible, you call me master, but I call you friend. It's a very interesting phrase. And this is what he says. Because a servant just does what he's supposed to do, but he never embraces it as his own. But a friend, your concern, your need is my need. And so Jesus wasn't complimenting his disciples. He was commissioning them. He was commissioning them. That which I do, ye shall do in greater things. He wasn't complimenting them. He was commissioning them. And that's what I figured out in that car. Oh my gosh, this isn't Swamiji's project. This is my project. This is my salvation. If I'm going to walk in the footsteps of these masters, I have to walk in their footsteps. I can't walk on the side and just comment about what they're doing. I have to put my feet where they put their feet. And master's first public work when he finished his training with Sri Yukteswar, he went out and started a school, a school for children. Because even at that time in India, in the 19, early 1900s, he himself was appalled by the materialistic nature of education. And what he could see it was doing to the souls of the children and inevitably to the culture of the country. Now, no matter what the system, great teachers in any place, great principles can guide children in the right direction. I want to say that first because I know there are many great and dedicated people in the world working on education. So I'm not talking about individuals. I'm talking about cultural attitudes. And the condition of education in this century and in the century before, but increasingly is just moving farther and farther and farther away from what human beings really need. I mean, quite even apart from God realization. But just to have happy relationships, to have kindness, to have confidence. It's the given. Success in high school now is if you can cope with the impossible stress of it. But, but very few, too few, back up and say, how did we ever get here? How did we ever get to the point where more mental health professionals in the high school are the way to go? There was a wonderful article a woman wrote after the most recent suicide in the Palo Alto school system, which is so painful you can hardly bear to even think about it. She dropped out. She had dropped out of Palo Alto High School 30 years before. And she said, and she talked about how the, the crazy craze for grades, they all went into the, the girls all went to the bathroom and sniffed cocaine before their tests so they could do better. And she was a top student from a fine school. She said it was just the culture. The culture was all about what can you achieve. Challenger School in this area says self-esteem through achievement. That's what it's called. Self-esteem through achievement. Bring your six-year-old or your four-year-old to the school so we can give him self-esteem through achievement. But what happens when you can't achieve? What happens when life turns on you? What happens when you just find yourself where, where that doesn't work? Because from four years old, you've had nothing but building your resume so you can get into the right high school, so you can get to the right college, so you can get to the right job. <sighs> But nowhere, where is the soul? What to speak of the creative spirit? What to speak of the heart? I read, oh, I, let me just finish this woman's thought. She just wrote, she said, she was writing to teenagers. She said, if you think Palo Alto High School is killing you, it is. 
she said. And she just quit. She traveled around the world. She said, there are many, many ways to be intelligent, to be successful, even to be educated, than to get a 4.5 grade point average in one of the top 10 high schools in the country. Because we are so much more than that. And thank God there are teachers in all schools who are giving that to children. But a revolution is needed. And that revolution, revolutions never look like anything when they start. Because they have to start from nothing. We've been running this high school, this school here up to eighth grade for 25 years now. We have students who've gone all the way through and are all on their own. We, we keep their pictures up there. I keep thinking, why do we keep these pictures? Because now it says, you know, mathematics degree from Cornell, doctor, this, that, which is all to the good. But what it really says is happy, well-adjusted, learned about life, know how to cope, and in some cases, love God. Oh my, what a wonderful thing to give. Standing from where we are, what is really needed? So a revol I started to say, when that school started, <laughs> we were in the funniest situation because we, we, didn't, we had nothing, literally nothing. We were sitting in the living room of our apartment saying to a group of parents, and I discovered parents are really protective of their children, especially their little children. So we said, we need, we're going to start a school, but we don't actually have one until you give us your child. So give us your child so that we can make a school. And it was a hard sell. <laughs> But I remember sitting with a group of parents and looking at the blank spot on the carpet. And I suddenly kind of got what was going on in the room because I'd been part of this for so long. I understood how revolutions are made. I said, oh, I see. You're looking at the blank spot in the carpet and you see a blank spot. I said, I know there's a school there. I absolutely know there's a school there. And, and my, my other favorite was this, young, this man, uh, uh, Lawrence, I forget his last name at the moment, um, Tulis Bird, that was his name, Lawrence Tulis Bird, because his daughter was Kelly Sinead Tulis Bird, who she told us repeatedly, I am Kelly Sinead Tulis Bird, she told us like that. She was about very small. Her name was bigger than she was, but she had it. And uh, he himself was an entrepreneur, and he asked David something about the school. And David described how, you know, we were going to finance it from the church and this and that. And probably at the end of the first year, it would take about $25,000, $30,000 to launch it just in a small room, which is a lot more money 25 years ago. And David just intuited that he was talking to a kindred spirit. And as soon as Lawrence understood that we had nothing, but we knew what we were doing, he just signed up both his kids. First, first daughter, then the son came after. Because he got it. He got that if you're a visionary, if you have the energy, if you have the experience, if you have the track record, if you have the sense, and if you have the will and the commitment, and if you have friends in high places, we can do it. And we have to finish the high school because high school is really, really where it comes apart for kids. And every time we have to give over our children to some of the places that they really want to go. It's very hard for us, but if we could just take them all the way through to the 12th grade, I would feel we had done what we came here to do for God. And I read something very interesting that Swami said about education for life, which is a little over here. Master came to America, to this planet at this time, with many missions. And one of them was to further progress a very interesting cycle. The Jewish concept of God was the law. So the concept that, that existed then, and it was appropriate at the time, was divine law administered by a fair judge. And so the Jewish tradition, I would say, devolved because the revelation of every true religion is the same, but it focused on that. This is, the, this is the law. So when Jesus incarnated to the Jews, he went from the law to the Father. Because the Father is still exacting. These are divine concepts. This is not men and women. The Father is still exacting, but you also are the son of the Father and the daughter of the Father. So therefore, he loves you first. 
before he judges you. The judge is impersonal, the father is your own. Master moved it to the Divine Mother. And one of his primary purposes in coming to this country was to talk to us about God in terms, and these are the words Swami used, compassion, kindness, and mercy. And we think of that as feminine, and this is why there is this huge movement of women sort of into, the, into public life, because it's time for compassion, kindness, and mercy. And women make a grave mistake when they try to be the judge and the father in the sense of what our culture needs. But Swami said, education for life is education in compassion, kindness, and mercy. Think about what our planet needs at this time. Compassion, kindness, and mercy. How much of it do we see? And, and our, some of our alumni came back recently and talked to us about how they, how they change classes in some of these high schools here and how they have to gird themselves to make it through the crowds, you know? And they walk down those barren hallways with those, all those steel lockers and make it into their next room. Compassion, kindness, mercy. And Swamiji very interestingly said, education for life, which is what we call our living, it's the method behind our living wisdom schools. It's to bring Divine Mother back into the culture. Because that's what we're doing with these children. We're treating them with that compassion, kindness, and mercy. It's not hundreds of thousands of dollars for more mental health professionals than this marvelous invention that some young boy made that can block the door against the random shooters, you know, and now he's got started, he's going to be a millionaire before he's 20, selling these steel door blocks. There has to be a revolution. And the power of these masters. And this is what master came to bring. And interestingly, in 1998, when we had a colony leaders of the four, I think there were four Ananda communities at that point, or five, counting the village, Swamiji was talking about, he said it like this, he said, not every community can do everything that's part of Ananda. He said, maybe we should think about specializing. And I, I realized just yesterday when I was thinking about that, I think he said that specifically for us. Palo Alto should specialize in education, he said. Because if we can make the Living Wisdom School successful across the street from Stanford University, if in this area we can stand up with the best of them and say not only, you know, can we match academically and any other way you want to measure it and success in life, we can do it here. And if we can do it here, we have really planted a seed. When we were going to start our community, we said to Swami Kriyananda, should we ask God whether he wants us to do this? And Swami said to us, of course he wants us to do it, just like that. He said, don't spend any energy wondering whether this is God's will. Just say, we're going to do it. Show us how. And that was before this was even a dream. All of you just come into this building. As if this building, how do you think this building got here? It was everybody who came before you, and many of you, inch by inch by inch with absolute determination, saying, I will be not merely a disciple and a devotee, and I won't just come to get what I want from here. I understand that the fourth stage is to give. And this is not a fundraising talk, because it's not money we need. It's magnetism, it's power, it's commitment, and it's to get our friends involved, because they know we mean it. I'm going to tell you a very personal story, but it does relate. My mother as many of you know, had Parkinson's for the last 15 years of her life. And when she got Parkinson's, my father, who was a Virgo, went to the library and he found out everything that was going to happen. And it was very, 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 very sad. It was just a horrible day. But he also realized that the disease progresses first through your body, then it goes to your brain, and then you start having seizures. 
thank you, God, that did not happen to my mother to the very end of her life. She was mentally actually astute right to the end. But right at the end, she started having seizures. And I happened to be there one of the times, and she was, they lived in Los Angeles, and we went to, I was in the emergency room, and for some reason in my memory, it was like this great big room, and my mother was the only one there, and she, they'd given her something to calm her down. She, by then she was small, and she's just a tiny lump in the bed, like this. And uh, <laughs> I thought, this can't go on. You know, this is, this is not an option. And, and I, I called all the gurus in. And in my mind, they were all sitting in chairs like this in front of me. And I actually said, I have done a lot for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I am going to call in a favor at this point. And I said, this is not an option. You know, this, this absolutely cannot go on like this. And I just told it to him. I didn't threaten to quit. <laughs> but I really said, you owe me. You really owe me, and I want it now. And two weeks later, she was gone. Just had one more seizure. I was actually had left the country. My sister called. Mom died, she said. I said, good for her. And it was a funny response, but it was just time. Good for her. But she died. Because when we really set our will to something, the masters are with us. And can you imagine what it would mean to all those children who can come to our school if we actually really have a high school and eventually we get a campus if we have K through 12 all on one campus. Can't you see it? I see a plain spot on the rug. But don't you see it? Think what it will mean for your children, for us when we, reincar we reincarnate, <laughs> for all those children who can come, for the power of this planet. You know, so much that we do is like riding on water, but not this. Generations. Kindness, compassion, mercy. This is our duty. We need children. It's very simple. You can have everything you want, but you need the children. <laughs> and you need their parents. It works two ways. The children feel the call. And especially at that age, they can feel the call then their parents need the courage. The parents need the courage to follow their own intuition and know that this is not merely an okay choice. This is God's choice. This is what's needed. Now, we'll go on with the rest of our service, but at the end, we're going to come back. We're going to do a fire ceremony and an affirmation. I'm going to call in all the favors I can call in and say, we'll do our part, Lord. You have to do yours. God bless you.